Good morning to everybody. I'm so happy that you're joining us here online. Wherever you may be, we are so thankful Amen. that you're with happy us. Happy Sabbath, everybody. The Word of God is always ripe and right for any season. Isn't God good? Hasn't God been good to you? The time is right to proclaim Jesus as the hope of all the world. It is such a joy to be with you today as we come to you in your homes. Uh, we come to you in your homes via Facebook, via YouTube, uh, via the South Leeward Conference website. We come to you in your homes via Second Advent Radio. And uh, we are just so happy to be here with you. Spread the word along all of your non apprentice friends and partners. The church is now called to worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. You Good morning and happy Sabbath to all the saints who are scattered throughout the South Leeward Conference territory. If you are viewing from beyond the South Leeward Conference, we say a very special welcome to you today. This week we have been focusing on health. The Seventh-day Adventist Church believes and promotes healthful living. And we have had, indeed, a wonderful, wonderful time. You know, we have been talking about men's health. We have been focusing on exercise. We have been talking about the importance of, of, of resting well, of, of, of not being engaged in violence, etc. It has just been a rewarding and just a, a, a wonderful experience throughout this week. Now, today... We culminate the activities for this week. But we want to share that it is important that we all understand that ending the week does not mean in any way that we are ending our health emphasis. We continue to practice good health. And my challenge to you today is to make a commitment to be a healthful liver. Be, be a strong, healthy person, an advocate, if you will, for good health. That is what God wants from us. The scripture says that his desire is that we prosper and be in good health. And so the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the South Leeward Conference Territory welcomes you to our final Sabbath emphasis on health. We trust that the information shared this week was beneficial, was meaningful, and as you continue to live your life, be strong, be positive, and be healthy for Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Our opening song will be, I will sing of Jesus' love.
you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37. Let us take a closer look at God's word. And it reads, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? 37 and last, and he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. May God add his richest blessings to the reading and understanding of his holy words. now time for our intercessory prayer. Kindly bow your heads with me as we talk to God. Eternal Father, today we are so grateful to be in your presence. 
We are thankful to you for all your blessings upon us. You have been so good to us over the six days of the week. And now we are here on your Sabbath day to give you praise and to give you thanks and to give you glory. We are thankful to you for the week's activities. And today as we climax this health week, we pray that you will continue to bless your people. We pray that you will be with the speaker of the hour, even brother David Williams. We know you've used him in times past, but today we pray that you will place a special anointing on him as he breaks to us the bread of life. May your hungry people be fed and filled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That evening, the people saw the second worst fire in the history of Manaus, a city of 2.1 million located in the heart of the northern Brazilian Amazon rainforest. Approximately 600 houses in a very poor neighborhood were destroyed, leaving 2,500 people without a home and even their personal belongings. By the end of the day, local Adventist churches and Adra had already served 300 meals and given 500 basic food baskets, clothes, bedding, shoes, and other necessities to those who had lost almost everything. While many residents stood in line to receive help from the church or government for their basic needs, one Haitian popsicle seller thrilled the relief teams with an impressive act of altruism. Even though most of the Haitians living in Brazil struggled to survive as refugees after an earthquake ravaged their country in 2010, this man walked up the line of the survivors, giving away all the popsicles remaining in his box. These popsicles were his only source of income. A small act, a huge impact. As a modern representative of the poor widow, this man was moved to give all that God had placed in his hand in order to help others. As you return your tithe and give your promise, pray that the Lord enables you to imitate Christ, who sacrificed all, even his life, for the redemption and well-being of others. May we put our desires last and God first. We will now go to God as we ask him to bless the offering. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies towards us. We thank you especially now for your bounty. We ask you to bless the offering and may it go to finish your work here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
boys and girls. I am so happy to be here today because I'm going to tell you about God's plan for your life. Now in the Bible, he says in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, boys and girls, that's an amazing thing to know that our Creator has great plans for you. Well, you may ask, what is a plan? Let me tell you. A plan is knowing what to do in advance. And God knows what He wants for us in advance because He made us. So before you were born, He knows what plans He has for you. But how do we know what his plan is? Well, let's pretend that your life is my car. Now, when I bought my car, I received an owner's manual. That's a little book which tells me everything about my car. Now, it is written by the persons who made my car. They want me to take good care of my car. Now, what if I decided that I did not want to follow that, those rules in my owner's manual? I wanted to do my own thing and go and read my own manual. So guess what will happen? Let's see. So let's pretend I like juice. And I would put juice in my car under the hood because I like juice. And let's pretend that I like milk so much that I decided to put it in my car. What do you think will happen to my car, boys and girls? You're right. My car will not work. In fact, I think my car might be damaged permanently. No, during this health week, I want to share something so exciting with you. It is just a simple word called new start because God wants you to be healthy and happy. He wants you to grow up to be good, strong boys and girls. So we're going to lead, we're going to use every single letter of that word new start so that we can learn about healthy living. So the first letter is nutrition. Now for the little ones, nutrition might, might be a big word. But nutrition only means that it's the food you need to grow strong and healthy. God wants us to be strong and healthy. That is why he took so much time making healthy fruits and vegetables for us to eat. So when mommy puts those fruits and vegetables in your lunch kits or on your plates, don't forget to eat them up because this will make you strong and healthy. Now the next letter is E, exercise. And exercise simply means moving around, jumping, skipping, running, rolling. As long as you're moving and you're exercising, you will be healthy. Let's move on to W. W stands for water. Now I know some of you don't like to drink water, but water is essential. Water is important for you to drink. Now let's pretend that you take soda to take a bath. Would you take a bath with soda or with sweet drinks? No, I wouldn't do that because guess what? I would probably end up sticky and yucky. Well, the same thing happens when you drink too much soda or sweet drinks. Inside of your body won't be nice and fresh and clean because inside will be sticky and yucky. So remember to drink your water, boys and girls, every single day. Now the next letter is S. S stands for sunlight. And we have so much of sunlight in our Caribbean. We can go outside and get soak up that vitamin D because that is essential for us to be healthy. Now the last letter is temperance. Now temperance is a very big word, but it means moderation or it means not overdoing. So when you see those cookies, instead of taking 10 of them, just take three. 
because you must be moderate or temperate. So what's the next letter? The next letter is A. A stands for air. <gasps> fresh air. Go outside, boys and girls, and expand your lungs. Get that fresh air inside of your lungs so that you can be good and strong and healthy. So what letter do you think we have coming up next after A? Yes, you are right. R. R stands for rest. So no late nights for you boys and girls. Go to sleep on time so that you can wake up fresh and you can wake up vibrant. You can wake up so that you're ready to learn. You're ready to face the day because when you get enough rest, you can be cheerful and active for the new coming day. Our next letter is T, and that's the final letter. Trust in God. Boys and girls, you are not too young to have trust in God, you know. You are not too young to rely on his word and on his user manual. And his user manual is this, the Bible. And he gives us everything we need in the Bible. If you believe, he will give you a crown of life. If you place your confidence in his word, he will give you all the treasures that you need. And dear boys and girls, I just want to say to you, he's in control. He knows what he's doing. He has a plan and it's a good plan. You see, if you follow those simple rules, you will succeed. And so if you, boys and girls, instead of doing the wrong things for your body, if you do the right things, you will be like this car. When I put oil under the hood, and if I put fuel or gasoline in my car, you know what's gonna happen? Yes, my car will run and I can take it wherever I wanna go. I can drive all over and my car will last for a long, long, long time. So boys and girls, remember, new start, new start will give you the tools you need to live a happy, healthy, and productive life. Oh,
on behalf of the South Leeward Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Truly, all around the South Leeward Conference are persons who believe in the Adventist health message and continue to promote good health. I am especially thankful to the presidents of the associations. In St. Kitts, we have Dr. Marissa Carty. Dr. Carty, you're doing a tremendous job there with your team. May God continue to bless you as you seek to inspire hope and change hearts. And in Nevis, 
we have Mrs. Junie Powell. Mrs. Junie Powell, quiet, thorough, and always seeks to give her best. Thank you, Mrs. Powell, for your hard work. You continue to ensure that your team works with you to ensure quality product. And then we have in Antigua, Mrs. Carolita Joseph. Mrs. Carolita Joseph, we wish to thank you for your hard work that you have put into this week and you have continued to give to the South Leeward Conference along with a strong team who works behind of you. May God continue to bless you as you too seek to change hearts and inspire hope. Now, you are at home. We want to say thank you because without you, we would not have had a conference. Without you, there's no need for the health message. I challenge all of you today, seek to live healthier lives. Let us all get fit for the kingdom of God. Tiene Cristo, una mansión de gloria. everyone. Today it is my privilege and our delight to introduce to you Dr. David Williams. Dr. Williams is the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a professor of African and African-American studies and sociology at Harvard University. He holds an MPH from Loma Linda University and a PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan. Dr. Williams is an internationally recognized social scientist focused on social influences on health. He is a man of God. He loves and promotes the Seventh-day Adventist health message. Dr. Williams also serves as Honorary Associate Director of Health Ministries for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Today, it is our delight, sir, to welcome you to the South Leeward Conference, and I pray that hearts will be blessed as you speak to us today. Happy Sabbath to everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be with you today and to bring you the message for today, which is entitled, God's Plans for You. Let us look to the Lord uh, before we look to his word. Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. As we open the pages of your word today, I pray that what we know not, you would teach us. What we have not, you would give us. But above all, Lord, what we are not, make us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, the scripture for today comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. 
And it tells a very familiar story. We know it as the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus told the story of a certain man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the journey, the traveler had to pass through a part of the wilderness of Judea. The road led down a wild, rocky ravine where gangs of robbers liked to hide out. The poor man, minding his own business, was brutally attacked, robbed of all that was valuable, beaten, and left bloodied and half dead by the wayside. While he was lying in pain, a priest came by. He took one look at a suffering man, and he kept on going. Next came a Levite. He paused to take a careful look, but he was too busy, and he did not want to get involved. As the story goes, a certain Samaritan on his journey came where the sufferer was, and when he saw him, the Bible tells us he had compassion on him. He did not question whether the stranger was a Jew or a Gentile. He took off his own garment to cover him. The oil and wine provided for his own journey, he used to heal and refresh the wounded man. He lifted him up onto his own beast and moved slowly along with an even pace so that the stranger might not be jarred and made to suffer any increased pain. The Bible says he brought him to a motel and cared for him through the night, watching him tenderly. In the morning, as the sick man had improved, the Samaritan left, but he paid the man's bill and left a deposit for any additional expenses that he might incur. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave us a picture of himself and his mission. And understanding God's plan for our lives, individually, as a congregation, as a denomination, must begin with a new appreciation of what Jesus has done for us. Men and women on planet Earth have been wounded, abused, deceived, bruised, robbed, and ruined by our enemy called Satan. We have been left on the side of the highway to perish. But Jesus found us ready to die, and he had compassion about our pain. He undertook our case. Our situation seemed hopeless, but Jesus cared about our helpless condition. Jesus left the comforts of glory to come and rescue us. We were wounded and bleeding, but Jesus came with healing. He did not pour oil and wine into our wounds, but he gave his precious blood. He healed our wounds. He covered us with his robe of righteousness. He opened a refuge of safety and he made complete provision for us at his own expense. Jesus has placed all of the charges for our full recovery on his account. The good news from the Bible this morning is that God has not given up on you. God loved you 2,000 years ago. He loves you today. And he will continue to love you. Why? Because God sees value in you. He sees a beautiful future for you. The good news for us today is that we have a Savior who came down to our house of pain. And he feels what we feel. Jesus knows how you are feeling right now. There may be some here this morning who are burdened by all the stress and the pressure 
of this week. There may be some here today who are tired and exhausted. There are some who are grappling with deep emotional pain because of past experiences. There are some today who may feel trapped in a bad situation, but the Bible gives us good news. The Bible declares that our Jesus is on the Jericho Road today. Jesus knows what nobody else knows. He understands your struggle in a way that no one else does. Jesus himself has weighed every burden you have carried this week. He has felt your pain. He has seen your tears. And regardless of the situation you are in, Jesus knows how you feel. Whether you are dealing with the stress of leadership or the disappointment of friends who have let you down, you need to know that no one understands like Jesus. Whether you have been falsely accused by your co-workers or you are struggling with family tension, Jesus understands what you are facing. The Bible declares he bears our griefs and carries our sorrows. You may be feeling today that nobody knows the trouble you see, but the truth is that nobody knows like Jesus. Jesus the master of heaven and earth and sky is looking down at you this morning with love, compassion, sympathy, and tenderness. He sees you where you are weary. He knows where you are lonely. He sees you when you are discouraged. And Jesus is on the Jericho Road this morning. He has stopped by to pick you up today and hold you close with the deepest, richest, strongest bonds of his love that you have ever experienced. Not only does Jesus know and understand how we feel, but the Bible tells us he has made every provision to address all of our needs. You see, Jesus comes with all the power of the universe with him, and he knows exactly what we need. He knows every circumstance of our lives. He knows the power of temptations that we struggle with. He understands the situations that irritate us and the people that bothers, bother us. He knows where we are weak. He knows the missteps and the false steps that may have led to our current predicament. And Jesus meets you on the Jericho Road this morning he says to each one of us, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. The story of the Good Samaritan today provides a key to God's amazing plan for your life and for my life. In this story, the injured man accepted everything that the Good Samaritan offered him. He followed his every direction. He obeyed his every command. You see, that injured man was convinced that here was someone who loved him, someone who cared for him, someone who was looking out for his best, and he resigned himself to stop worrying, to stop fretting, and just depend on the leading and direction from the Good Samaritan. I believe that each of us can learn something from that wounded man today. The wounded man in our story did not resist being carried. He did not reject the companionship of the journey. He just accepted everything that was offered. Why? Because the injured man was incapable of helping himself. He could not rescue himself. He could not heal himself. He could not save himself. The same is true of you and me when it comes to our salvation. We are saved by God's grace. Our great danger is self-sufficiency. 
Our Achilles heel is feeling that we can handle things ourselves. I like the way the book Ministry of Healing puts it. It says, nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly or completely on the merits of the Savior. And so today, I invite you to learn to lean on Jesus. If we are going to start living God's plans for our lives, we need to learn to lean on Jesus. Yes, learning to lean. We need to learn to lean. Learn to lean on Jesus. We can all find more power than we have ever dreamed as we learn to lean on Jesus. Jesus has a wonderful plan for each of us. He wants to take us on the journey of life. We don't know where to go, but Jesus does. He will not give us direction where we need to go and send us on our journey. No, the Bible promises us that Jesus says he will take us with him. He will accompany us. He will personally direct us. We have the assurance of his presence with us. We also have the promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. We have the ironclad guarantee. Lo, I am with you always, even on to the end of the world. My brothers and sisters this morning, I believe this story gives us God's model for health ministry. The most important thing in health ministry is developing loving relationships with people in need. Health ministry is similar to courtship. When you are in love with someone, you show them you care. We live in a world where many people are hurt. When they are in pain, when they are discouraged, just a little kindness, just a little caring, just a little understanding and sympathy can be like a refreshing cup of water in a harsh desert of discouragement. In fact, when we look at the spirit of prophecy, we find the powerful words, we find the powerful words in the spirit of prophecy that tells us in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, that words of kindness, looks of sympathy, expressions of appreciation would be to many a struggling, lonely one as a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. And that's what God is calling us to be. That's God's plan for each one of us. That is spelled out very clearly in the book Ministry of Healing, page 143. It tells us that Christ's methods alone will give us true success in reaching the people. What are Christ's methods? The Savior mingled with others as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. And then he bade them follow me. That is the model of Jesus. And that is what he is calling us to do in our work for him, in our ministry for him. Those are the steps he wants us to follow. In fact, what we are told, Jesus was very clear in John 13, 35, that the key to discipleship, the test of being a true follower of his, is if we have love one for another. And we can find that same text, John 13, 35, in the Living Bible, it says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Or I like the way the Message Bible puts it. This is how everyone 
will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus clearly indicates what it means to be a Christian. The test of Christianity is not the doctrines that you believe, although understanding the truth of Scripture is important. The acid test of being a follower of Jesus is not demonstrated by your tithing behavior or your dietary behavior or your devotional behavior or your frequency of church attendance as important as all of these things are. No, Jesus says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. We live in a world of large inequities in health, of lots of people not doing well in terms of health. And the data on the slide from COVID-19 has highlighted these inequities in health. And what they show is there are large racial differences in COVID-19 mortality. Blacks or African Americans, I will use the terms interchangeably, were almost two and a half times more likely to die from the coronavirus. Another way to think of it is that if all racial ethnic groups had died at the same rate as white Americans, some 15,000 black people who died would not have died, and 1,500 uh, Latino Americans who died would not have died, as would hundreds of indigenous or Native American people who died would not have died. So there are these large inequities in health. And God's plan for us is that for these people on the Jericho Road, they will discover us as, they discover, as that man discovered the Good Samaritan. So why do these inequities in health exist? Well, if we look around the world, the strongest predictors of differences in health between different groups are income and education. And so one of the reasons why there are large racial ethnic differences in health in the United States is because there are large racial ethnic differences in income in the United States. I want to translate the income data in a way in which you cannot possibly miss the point. So I'm standardizing on the household income of whites as $1. And for every dollar of household income white households receive, Asian American households receive a dollar and 23 cents. One powerful reason for that is Asian American households have more persons contributing to household income. Latino households receive 73 cents. American Indian and African American households receive 59 cents. What is stunning about that 59 cents figure is that it's identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. You heard me right. In 1978, black families in America earned 59 cents for every dollar of income whites earned, and in 2018, they still earn 59 cents. Most of my students think that in the United States, we have narrowed the racial gaps in health. And if you look at data on poverty, and poverty is defined in 2018 as household income of $25,000 for a family of four. And you can find that there are large racial ethnic differences in poverty with one in five black households, um, one in four American Indian households, um, some almost one in five Hispanic households, and about 8% of white households and 10% of Asian households are in poverty. So there are lots of um, Americans who are living in poverty, and I'm saying poverty is one of the strong predictors of worse health. It is important to realize that I just showed you the rate of poverty in different groups, but the number of people in poverty is in fact very different. So the largest group of poor people are white households. There are almost 16 million whites who live in poverty in America compared to about 9 million African Americans 
and over 10 million um, Hispanics. So it's important to realize that when we talk about poverty and economic status, it cuts across all uh, population groups. And the data on poverty and income dramatically understate racial differences in economic circumstances. What do I mean when I say that? Well, income captures the flow of resources into the household. Wealth, or the assets, captures the savings, the reserves, the, the home equity that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. And when we look at data on wealth for the United States, we find that for every dollar of wealth white households have, black households have 10 pennies, Hispanic households have 12 pennies. So there are these very large racial ethnic differences in wealth. And why does that matter and what does that have to do with health ministry? When a household is of low economic status, it means that even though all Americans are in the same pandemic of COVID-19, those who are low in economic status are in different boats, boats that are less prepared to weather the storm. So what research shows us that low-income persons in America were more likely to get a coronavirus because they were less likely to be able to work from home. With their low-wage, non-salary jobs, Working from home was a luxury. Living in poor house neighborhoods with overcrowded housing, social distancing was a luxury. So that in lots of ways, these folks were disadvantaged and so die of higher rates. However, the important point this morning, my brothers and sisters, is that what we see with COVID-19, we see with virtually every leading cause of death in the United States. The same groups that are disadvantaged, low-income individuals, disadvantaged racial ethnic populations, higher death rates from COVID-19, higher death rates from heart disease, from cancer, from diabetes, from kidney disease. You go down the list, the pattern exists. And what does that all have to do with our ministry? God's plan for us is that we would follow the example of Jesus. The example of Jesus is found in John 1.14. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Or as the, the message Bible puts it, Jesus came and moved into our neighborhood. He came where we were in pain and he lived with us because he came to minister to us. God is calling us today in health ministry to follow in his steps. And Desire of Ages, page 640 says, in order to walk in the steps of Jesus, we shall find his footprints beside the sick bed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when he was here on earth, we shall walk in his steps. God's plan for you and me is to walk in the steps of Jesus in a ministry that meets the needs of others. In the spirit of prophecy, this ministry is called medical missionary work. Today we use the term comprehensive health ministry, and it is a, in fact comprehensive. It talks about instruction and nutrition, providing simple treatments, child care, ministering in church health clinics and centers, health combined with public evangelism, comforting the afflicted, caring for people, and meeting whatever the needs are that they have. Where do we find the rationale for this comprehensive health ministry? We find it in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, uh, tells us that God is calling us to a ministry of meeting the needs of others. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, 
and to bring the homeless poor to thy house. That is the ministry he's calling us, to meet the needs of others in practical ways. And he promises us that if we only do that, if we only give ourselves to the hungry and satisfy the desire of those who are afflicted, then our light will rise in darkness and our gloom will become as midday and God will continually guide us and satisfy the desires of our heart. So wonderful promises are given to us if we only follow the example of Jesus and meet the needs of others, the health needs and the other needs of others in practical ways. And by the way, this health ministry that Jesus is calling us to, this following the footsteps of the Good Samaritan on the Jericho Road that God, God is calling us to, is not just a good idea. It's not optional. You see in Matthew 25, verses 34 to 36, Jesus says on the great day of judgment, he will say, come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. Do you know what a stranger means? It means a foreigner. It means an immigrant. I was an immigrant, Jesus said, and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And just in case you missed the point, the centrality of our work meeting the needs of suffering humanity, the book Desire of Ages, page 637, makes it clear. It says, Thus Christ pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day. And he represented the decision as turning upon one point. There will be only two classes of people and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or neglected to do for Jesus in the person of the poor and suffering. So this is not just a good idea. It's the work that God has called us to do. Well, what can we do? What would a comprehensive ministry, health ministry look like? I want to take you down a brief walk down memory lane before I bring it home today as to what we can do and show you back in 1899, 18, 1893, sorry, what Dr. John Harvey Kellogg implemented, a comprehensive health ministry in the city of Chicago based on reading the spirit of prophecy recommendations of how we make the ministry of Jesus real. He developed a Chicago medical mission. It provided a free medical dispensary. It provided a clothing distribution program. It provided a homeless shelter that served 400 people every night. It provided a soup kitchen that served 500 to 1,500 people a day. There was work in the homeless shelter for those who spend the night there. There was a lifeboat rescue mission. He had a halfway, a ministry to rescue prostitutes from the red light district at night. And when they left the life of prostitution, there was a place where they could come and find a home. There was a maternity home uh, for unwed mothers. He had a farm outside the city uh, for drug rehab and the homeless. He had a school for Chinese, very significant. Because in 1882, the America passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. If you were from China, you could not come to America. So the Chinese in the 1890s were a stigmatized population, and Dr. Kellogg included in his ministry a special outreach for this group. So it's a very comprehensive ministry is what he implemented. He also implemented a medical school in Chicago, and it offered a broad range of services, a kindergarten, a day nursery, a free laundry for women, 
classes in first aid, hygiene, diet, uh, child training, dress. It operated a free employment agency. It had a placement service for orphans, a placement service for men and women who were redeemed from Skid Row. What I'm saying is that was a comprehensive ministry and had a medical school that enriched it as well. My point is, where did those ideas come from? You can find them, my brothers and sisters, in the book Ministry of Healing, the comprehensive ministry of meeting human need that God has called us to. I just want to give you a couple quick examples of what Ministry of Healing talks about in terms of this comprehensive ministry. Ellen White says, attention should be given to the establishment of various industries so that poor families can find employment. Carpenters, blacksmiths, and indeed everyone who understands some useful line of labor should feel a responsibility to teach and help the ignorant and the unemployed. She also goes on to talk about job training. By instruction in practical lines, we can often help the poor most effectively. So practical advice is all part of the health ministry that God is calling us to do. Another quotation, Ministry of Healing, page 194. Let the members of poor households be taught how to cook, how to make and mend their own clothing, how to nurse the sick, how to care properly for the home. Again, practical counsel that God is giving us. So let's bring, make this contemporary. What can SDA churches do today? What can we do? I think there's a lot that all of us can do. Yes, Seventh-day Adventist hospitals can give an emphasis to prevention and the delivery of care, can develop incentives and interventions to reduce normally occurring implicit biases that lead to inequities in care. Yes, we can provide care that addresses the need of the whole person. All of that is part of comprehensive health ministries. What can SDA churches do? We need to develop programs that reach out and touch our community and minister to their need, increase their knowledge about sleep, about food, about fitness, but offer programs that are practical and minister to the needs they face as they deal with the stresses of life. And what can the average Adventist member do? Yes, we can volunteer with church or community programs that provide services and support advocacy for the least of these. We can spend time with people who are in distress. We can volunteer at a crisis center. We can become informed about the social needs in our community and ask God's guidance in making the love of Jesus real to people in need. I'm saying when we look at the life of Jesus, when we look at the ministry of Jesus, he spent his time meeting the needs of others. I'll hear some quotes from the book Ministry of Healing. Jesus was always patient and cheerful. None who came to him went away unhelped. Whatever their problem was, he helped them. The Savior's work was not restricted to any time or place. His compassion knew no limit. His love was evident in all he did. It continues, it was heaven to be in his presence. With tender, courteous grace, he ministered to the sin-sick soul, bringing healing and strength. My brothers and sisters, why does Jesus tarry? What is Jesus waiting for this morning? I want to leave you with this powerful statement. What is Jesus waiting for? Christ Subject Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, he will come to claim them 
as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it continues, were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly, the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. When we think of the gospel message to all the world, we often think of the teaching of the truth of the Bible. And do we need the teachings of the truth of the Bible in the world? Yes. But God's greatest need is to transform us, to represent Jesus, to walk and talk and care like Jesus, to make a difference in our communities the way Jesus made in his. That is our calling. That is his vision for us. That is what he's calling us to do. And so he has placed us in communities with human need. He's placed us in places where people are suffering and Jesus wants us to make the gospel real to him. I don't know about you this morning. I am thankful that I serve a risen savior. I am thankful that that risen savior is willing to give me his resurrection power so that I can live for him, that I can touch the needs of everyone he brings along my path, that I can make a difference in my community, that our churches will catch the spirit of the work he's calling us to do in the book Ministry of Healing, in Isaiah 58, in Matthew 25, so that we can be transformed by his spirit to love like Jesus, to touch the lives of others like Jesus, to have our hearts broken by the things that break the heart of Christ. We cannot do it in our own strength. We don't have the power. We don't have the love. But Jesus is willing to perform heart surgery on each one of us. He's willing to take the stony heart out of our flesh and give us a heart of flesh. Today he says, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, will you give me your life? Will you let me live out my life within you? Will you let my love be real and shine out from you to everyone with whom you come in contact? That is our prayer. That is our opportunity. That is what God is calling each one of us to do. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of salvation. We thank you that Jesus met us on the Jericho Road. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity he has given us to join him on that road and to make a difference in ministering to the need of the sick, the suffering, the poor, the disadvantaged in our communities. We cannot do it in our own strength. But Lord, we place our will on your side. Take us, use us, make us everything you want us to be, and we'll be careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Our closing song will be marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt.
Let's pray to close, Almighty God and Eternal Father. We are so thankful to you today for your words to us. Indeed, your words have been a blessing to our hearts. We not only ask for a blessing on the message, but we ask you to bless the messenger as well. We have been fed for the entire week, and now our cups are full and running over. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning to everybody. I'm so happy that you're joining us here online. Wherever you may be, we are so thankful Amen. that you're with happy us. Happy Sabbath, everybody. The Word of God is always ripe and right for any season. Isn't God good? Hasn't God been good to you? The time is right to proclaim Jesus as the hope of all the world. It is such a joy to be with you today as we come to you in your home. Uh, we come to you in your homes via Facebook, via YouTube. Uh, via the South Leeward Conference website. We come to you in your homes via Second Advent Radio. And uh, we are just so happy to be here with you. Spread the word along to all of your non-apprentice friends. 